Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning to some, good evening to others. Thank you for joining us. Today, we're going to be covering the live tutorial on how to automate the Incozy guide for writing requirements. Today, we're going to cover how to make the best uh, make the best practices for requirement writing easier to manage, uh, improving the quality and readability of your documents, and pr producing the volume of internal and external back and forth. So, what I mean by that is the conversations that are had around. What exactly does this requirement mean? What are you trying to say here? What does that entail, both in your own review meetings and then also uh, when you're meeting with uh, the other companies that you're working with, whether you're suppliers or clients, just making sure that everybody's on the same page. So we'll dive right in. My name is James, I'm in sales here at QRA. Uh, on the chat host, we have Trevor Bradley, he's in our marketing team. So he's working the live chat. If you have any questions as we go along, feel free to uh, type them in and we will answer them uh, at the end of the tutorial. So the INCOSI Guide for Writing Requirements. INCOSI is the International Council on Systems Engineering. It is the most widely used and highly respected reference uh, on this topic. The current version of the INCOSI Guide for Writing Requirements includes 40 rules. That's in a list of other things, including characteristics for requirements statements, characteristics for sets of requirements, the rules for a requirement statement, just is what we're going to be talking about, and the attributes for requirement statements as well. So we're just covering one of those four categories. Uh, if you subscribe to Incozy, you can access the current version of that, which has the full details for all of these, uh, which I would encourage you to do uh, to stay up on this topic. So writing requirements in natural language. There are alternatives to this. So first we'll just talk about uh, why we write requirements in natural language and, and some of the benefits and shortcomings of that. So requirements can develop naturally out of discussions with stakeholders. So in the same way that you're communicating with them to understand what this uh, product, device, service, uh, software tool is going to accomplish. At the same time, you can be writing those things down as you go along and having your requirements written in natural language makes it a lot easier to do that and to, to formalize those requirements as you move along. So the informality of natural language makes it easy to specify diverse concepts. So what we mean by that is that the uh, way that you actually approach writing these requirement statements, if it's in natural language, you don't have to struggle to figure out, okay, how do I implement this system or this tool or this method to communicate this? You can write it uh, in your own words to just communicate what it is that you expect the system to do. So the use of natural language and requirements has three common and severe problems, which we're going to talk about. So the first is ambiguity. So uh, as soon as an idea exists in your mind and you try to put it down on paper, you introduce the possibility that somebody is going to misunderstand exactly what it is that you're trying to convey. So that can be by the choice of words that you use or the way that the document is structured or run on sentences. There's a whole slew of issues. Uh, so ambiguity is the first problem. The second is inaccuracy. So as hard as you try to make the document uh, as accurate as possible to what it is that you're trying to say, there's always the opportunity that something that you uh, end up writing in there is just not going to be accurate with uh, either what is realistic or what the function of the system is actually supposed to accomplish. The third is inconsistency. So across large documents, and especially the larger that these documents become, it becomes increasingly difficult to make sure that you're not either repeating yourself or contradicting yourself at different points, or even unrelated, seemingly unrelated systems uh, end up in conflict with each other, uh, whether they're sharing resources or need to be happening at the same time. Uh, those issues can all lead to inconsistencies, which are very, make it difficult to test, as well as implement those solutions as you go along. There's a couple of uh, solutions for uh, addressing these issues. One is to write your requirements in abstract notations. We actually, uh, several of you filled out the survey that we had sent out beforehand, and we appreciate your input on that. Uh, some of you saying that you are writing requirements using UML. There's other systems, earn uh, Z notation, or in Canada, as we call it, Z notation, uh, and uh, chaos, etc. So these systems are in various ways trying to formalize what you've written in natural language, and instead of writing it in sentence form, you communicate it through, uh, through models. So uh, some pros and cons to that is that uh, you can write things more concisely, but you lack sometimes that control uh, over exactly what it is that you're trying to say in order to communicate something that's a little bit more complex. Uh, some other issues that come up with that is they can't be used throughout the entire uh, systems engineering process. So the reason for that is anybody that's reading these requirements might not have the same technical knowledge that you do, different stakeholders that are involved. So it can become a challenge to uh, communicate these to them. And a lot of times you'll end up translating them into natural language anyway. 
So project stakeholders might have a wide variety of backgrounds, might not be familiar with these abstract methods. So as a result, uh, the actual implementation of these methods is, has been fairly slow on the uptake. About 95% of engineering specifications still use some form of natural language along the process. So that's where we come in. The next way to approach uh, the problems with, uh, with requirements in that way with the natural language is by using guides, uh, rule sets, and checklists. So the INCOSI guide is most well known and most commonly used standard for this. Uh, there's 40 rules and it takes two pages just to list them uh, in the document. So following all of these rules and company standards while writing can be a challenge. So just to keep them all in mind, and a lot of them uh, might be one specific rule, but uh, involved in that is a whole list of, of words or specific phrases that you're not supposed to use. And then you add on top of that your own company standards with the way that your team has decided to communicate the requirements to make it work within your system. And uh, it just becomes overwhelming for anyone to try to follow all of those rules and standards. So, Manually reviewing against all these rules is a tedious and time-consuming task. Uh, so from the different backgrounds that you folks are coming from, uh, from that survey that we submitted, we have folks in business management, software development, IT, automotive, medical devices, uh, designing industrial equipment, uh, and financial services. So uh, the risk level for these various industries can vary a lot, but uh, if you improve your requirement writing process to eliminate the issues that you have, Something that's common across all these industries is the ability to save time. So time savings, of course, equates to, uh, to money savings as well as you go along. So we're gonna talk about some tips on how you can automate those processes to make sure that everybody uh, is on the same page and that you're following these rules consistently. So I'll give an example from the start. We have a, a case study for a company that we worked with called Ultra Electronics. We can get a copy of that to you if you'd like. But they came to us with three goals. They wanted to reduce the total hours that were spent uh, discussing and correcting these vague and ambiguous requirements. They needed to standardize the requirements uh, process across large multidisciplinary teams. They are an uh, ISO 9000 compliant company. So they had these uh, industry standards, these regulations, and then also their own uh, different teams that they were working with that all had to be on the same page. But what was important to them as well was to mitigate the potential risks in their customer requirements uh, earlier in the bidding process. So if you have a customer that you're working with that has uh, their own requirements that they're submitting to you. Um, some of you folks that are in IT or software development would be dealing with this a lot, that you need to translate these requirements. If you can use an automated tool to, to point out the areas of those requirements that are vague or difficult to track, it'll make a big difference in, uh, in your ability to uh, move forward confidently by addressing those right from the get-go. So how do you automate the Incozy guide? We're gonna be using uh, one of QRA's tools, QB Scribe, today. Uh, my purpose in writing this uh, webinar today, this live tutorial, was to make it uh, beneficial for anybody that's joining, regardless of whether uh, you use QVScribe or not. We're going to be reviewing each of the 40 rules for the Incozy guide, focusing in on a few of those. I will be jumping in and out of the tool, QVScribe, to show you how that works in the process. And at the end, I'm going to share a link with you to actually allow you to share with us what your process is like. Uh, some of you did that already before the call, but that just helps us to learn how we might uh, interface with the tools that you're already using. So we'd certainly invite you to fill that out uh, at the end and then we can follow up with you. So what was really important for us in developing QVScribe was to find that balance. We looked for tools that were out there that could help writing requirements in natural language to improve the overall quality, improve the readability, make it testable and uh, ensure some sort of consistency across your uh, entire document. So we looked at the technology that was available today and it was really important for us to find that balance between what the technology was capable of doing while still leveraging the, the expertise and the knowledge uh, that you, the professional, brings to the table. So there's a quote from the INCOSI guide. It's actually talking about uh, different uh, categories that you can track or different uh, tags that you can put on your requirements, but it says, a time-saving tool should not take more time to maintain then it saves. And we think that that's really important. So when we wrote uh, QV Scribe, this tool uh, integrates directly within Microsoft Word, so Office and Excel, so that as you're writing your requirements in those tools, or if you're working with another requirements management tool, some of them that you had mentioned were Atlassian using Confluence and Jira, uh, Polarian, Integrity, uh, Master Control for the medical device world. Uh, we also interface with those tools through uh, Microsoft Excel. So you can export a report, analyze it in Excel, and then plug it back in. But we knew if it was a, a, a really time consuming process, if you had to spend a lot of time training the tool to do exactly what you wanted it to do, 
it just wouldn't get used and there wouldn't be that adoption across your whole company. So we made it really uh, a priority for us to give you the information that you needed while still relying on that expertise that the uh, subject matter experts have. So uh, what our tool is looking for is, is this a good requirement? Uh, as your company implements QB Scribe, you can customize it so that it also follows your own company standards. But out of the box, uh, it's just checking to make sure that your requirement follows those accepted best practices like those that we find in the COSI guide. So that's what we're going to be reviewing today. So these are the 40 rules that are found in the current version of the NCOSI guide. They're actually numbered one through 44. Uh, through time, they eliminated some of them and rearranged them a little bit. So uh, it skips a few numbers along the way, but there are 40 in total. They're all listed here uh, on the screen. And the reason I have them up here, I'm just gonna break them down in a couple of different ways, just to make it a little less overwhelming. So first we can break it up by the way that they're actually sorted in the document itself. So we talk about uh, the first ones there that are on the left-hand side relate to the accuracy of the requirement. Then you'll see what we also talk about, non-ambiguity, singularity, realism, quantifiers, uniformality, and then there's a few other smaller categories that we're going to cover there as well. So for each of these categories, I'm going to be diving into one of them uh, specifically, and I'll be mentioning the others as we go along. But that's how it breaks down from the NCOSI guide. So ways that you get help with these things, for example, if you're using Microsoft Office or another word processor, uh, maybe you're using Grammarly or something like that, you'll get help with the grammar, the spelling, and the punctuation. Uh, but those other 37 uh, tasks are still your responsibility uh, as a subject matter expert. So even keeping these 37 things in mind, and some of those rules for grammar and punctuation are specific to requirement writing as well. So this is just a lot for you to handle. So some tools that currently exist that can help with that are various templates. So you can use templates to give your document a defined structure uh, to group relative uh, related requirements together. Uh, generate a, an overall project style guide for how your company will write requirements and then classify each requirement accordingly. So those are ways that templates and different other tools can help uh, along the process in that way. And you'll see this last one here. This is QB Scribe. So everything that's highlighted in blue are areas that QB Scribe can automate in your requirement writing process or at least give you the feedback, uh, give you some feedback to help you manage this and help you uh, identify these potential areas of concern. So if we give an overall breakdown of the things that you are responsible for if you're using QB Scribe versus the things that the tool can handle, everything that you see in blue there is handled by QB Scribe and everything that's there now a list of 10 things are what you're responsible for uh, writing as you go along the way. So you'll see the what not why the requirement should talk about what the requirement uh, is actually looking to accomplish, not the reasoning behind it. You can add that in a rationale statement. Also, you'll see that it highlights what, not how. So you're not talking about the implementation, but simply what is required because at the next stage in the actual design, you want to give flexibility for uh, creative solutions to help solve that problem as well. Uh, so a lot of these are a lot easier to keep in mind if you're only looking at this list of 10, and they actually have to do with the, the actual subject matter rather than uh, rules for uh, necessarily the, the way that it's structured or formatted. So if we can take th 30 out of the 40 uh, off of your plate so that you can focus on those 10, you'll find that your, your process of writing the requirements becomes that much easier and more efficient as you go. So we'll dive in here now. Uh, this is the way that QB Scribe actually breaks them down. We have three different types of analysis. There's the quality score, uh, which will also identify quality warnings. So those are identified in the green and the yellow on the list there. So this is evalu evaluating each requirement uh, based on the language that's included. So that will be proper use of imperatives, uh, vague language, whether the requirement itself is testable. Those things are all highlighted in those first two categories. Then we have a consistency score that's looking for the terms and units that are used throughout your document. And lastly, for similarity, that's making sure that you don't have redundant requirements uh, or unnecessarily repeated requirements, I should say and also making sure that you have uh, that you don't have contradictions of course in your requirements so if there's similar requirements that have uh, maybe just a few words that are different there's a possibility that those could be uh, in contradiction so we'll bring those to your attention to help with that as well so that's the breakdown of qv scribe i'll actually show you how it works in a moment here our goal here is to again keep you focused on the actual subject matter of what you're writing you, of course, are responsible to understand your particular project in your industry. You'll author the framework and you'll solve problems as they come about. The way that QB Scribe can help is by applying those principles. Again, 30 of the 40, uh, we can give assistance with that. Clarifying the content and then identifying those problems and bringing them to your attention. It's not writing the document for you. It's not making changes to your document. 
it's showing you where that work is needed and giving you uh, real feedback so that you can make those changes as you go along. So uh, one way that this can help you focus uh, as a professional, if it's bringing these things to your attention, again, you're focusing on the actual subject matter, not focusing on the, the nitty gritty kind of details of what you're writing. So that comes back to the philosophy that we have that writing requirements in natural language is the most efficient and effective way to write requirements. And by using some templates and some different formats and a tool like QBScribe, it allows you to safely write within natural language, uh, knowing that your requirements are going to be reviewed later on. So the first topic we're gonna to cover, uh, these first sets of requirements uh, are about accuracy. So the ENCOSI guide uh, stipulates that you should be using a definite article. So when you're talking about a particular system, it's the system, it's not a system. If you're talking about the user at any given time, the person who's using uh, your tool or your device is the user. Um, so calling them a user opens up the door that it could be um, any particular person, but you know that you're talking about the actual system or the user. So definite articles are a must. Uh, next is active voice. So this is an area that QVScribe can help. Uh, the ones that we identified earlier that uh, you're on your own for at this point, we're still always adding new features, uh, but they're uh, noted on the side there with an asterisk. So those are the ones that uh, you should pay extra attention to. Uh, passive voice detection, uh, an example for that is if a system says that the engine shall be turned off in a particular situation, you're not actually saying who or what is responsible for turning the engine off, you're just saying that it shall be turned off. Uh, the pa active voice version of that would be saying that the system shall turn off the engine in this given scenario. So using that active voice just makes it more clear on who or what is responsible for that. So uh, we have a passive voice detection that will show you if you are using a passive voice in your requirement. Next is that your requirements are level appropriate. So if you're talking about business requirements, then it will be the business shall. If you're talking about the actual system, you're talking about the system shall. Uh, if you're talking about stakeholders, stakeholders shall. So every requirement just by using that uh, what we talked about in the first one, the definite article, by using that appropriate to the level that you're talking about makes it clear uh, from the beginning who or what is responsible and what level you're dealing with as well. So sometimes lower level requirements will be mentioned in the higher level. Um, if there's a particular uh, brand or a particular item that uh, the stakeholders need for a certain item, that can be specified as well, but it should also use the tag for that level as well. So not the higher level, but whatever level uh, that actual requirement would belong to, even if it's grouped with the higher level requirements. Next is to use glossary terms only. So this is a way that QVScribe can help, and we're gonna get into this in a little bit with the uh, terms analysis. So uh, glossary terms only means that uh, if you're using throughout your document a particular term, uh, it should be the same thing every time if you're using that exact phrase, it should be used consistently throughout the document. So there's two ways to go about this. You can either write the glossary beforehand, and then as your users are going through it, if they need to add another word to it, they'd add to it as you go. We think with today's technology, there's a better way to do this, that you should actually write the requirements in natural language and do your best to keep it consistent with the terms that you're using, but actually create the glossary after your requirement uh, document is done its first revision. So QBScribe will automatically pull all of the nouns out of your document to create this glossary list that you can then use to make sure that they're properly defined and that they're used consistently. But it's really important that even the way that they're written, uh, in COSI uh, has one feature that I really like where they encourage you if you're using a term that has multiple words in it, use an underscore to connect them and use capital letters. That way when somebody is reading your requirement, if they see those words together, the system, and there's an underscore between them, it's clear exactly what you're talking about, that those two are related. And if there's a space between them, then those are separate systems or separate items, terms in your glossary. Next is appropriate units, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, using vague terms, so uh, this could be anything from, you know, saying that something shall be done efficiently or cost effective or appropriate. Uh, any of these words that are just not really giving clarity to what you're trying to say are only going to add a level of uh, ambiguity and confusion like we had talked about earlier. So this is a specification, so it's your job to specify what it is that you want and what is required of the team that's working on it. Uh, they will thank you for taking the time to put into it. And if you're using ambiguous terms, it's just a laziness on your part by not specifying exactly what you mean by your requirements. So uh, that is something that QBScribe will check for. There's a list of about 120 terms by default that it will flag, uh, but your company can add your own to that as well and remove terms as necessary. 
Next one is no escapes. So it's really easy in, in writing uh, to include these little phrases to say, you know, in so much as possible, uh, you should do this as required, uh, as appropriate, you should be adding these in. Uh, these are loopholes that you're adding to the specification that are, instead of saying when and how this needs to happen, you're opening it up for interpretation. So it's your responsibility at that point to actually specify under which conditions, uh, when is the appropriate time for this to happen and to define that within your requirements. If you need to add extra requirements at this point to specify that, then that is exactly what you should do. And then along the same lines, open-ended lists. So you'll see this in one of our examples that we're looking at after, um, the term et cetera. So if you're saying that the system will disengage if uh, any of these particular components, so maybe uh, the radars or the sensors uh, or the system in general, et cetera, fails, uh, that's an open-ended list. So some other examples of that are, if you say, and so on, uh, including but not limited to, such as, these are all implying that there's more to it that you're not saying. So it's important to uh, specify exactly what you mean by that. And again, list them as separate requirements as needed to make sure that each of those issues that you want to have covered are being looked after. So we'll jump back to appropriate units and spend a couple minutes talking about that. Uh, a reference that we talk about often, there's a lot of examples out there, but this is probably the worst that we've come across. So in 1999, NASA had a satellite that was supposed to collect information from Mars. Um, there was an engineer uh, early in the design process that was looking in the requirements. They had received their uh, specifications for the thrusters and one of them was actually written in uh, English units instead of metrics. So it was saying uh, newtons instead of pounds instead of newtons of force. And they assumed that this was just a typo and they changed it. So all of the, all of the formulas and all the calculations that they put together to control the thrust of the satellite were all off uh, by about three times. And they found that uh, they had to make 10 to 15 times more adjustments on the course when it was on its way to Mars than they were expecting to have. And then once it reached the planet, they had no control over the satellite. It ended up getting dangerously close, burnt up in the atmosphere. So a $125 million project that they had spent almost 10 years working on was a total loss. And that was because of inconsistent units used uh, way back in the requirement stage. So this is something that seems like it might be obvious, but it's, uh, it's one of those things that you need to make sure that you get it right. So I'm gonna show you what this looks like in QV Scribe. We have a specification here for a adaptive cruise control system. So it's called the FSRACC, the Full Speed Range Adaptive Cruise Control Spec. Uh, this is a real uh, high level specification. So I'm gonna dive in here. Uh, since QV Scribe is integrated within Word and Excel, you'll see that it gets its own ribbon across the top here once it's installed on your machine. So I can click QV Scribe over on the right and QVScribe will open uh, over, or on the left, I should say, and over on the right, it will open up here on the side. So we have our document open on the left. We have our requirements on the right. There's a process uh, called the Requirement Finder, a tool that will automatically identify the requirements in your document. That's already been done here, so each requirement is listed as its own statement. So all I need to do is click Analyze, and it's going to run those three types of analysis. So we're gonna start with the consistency this time because that's the first one on the list from the INCOSI guide. So you'll see that the way it identifies the units in the document, it lists them together. So anytime I'm talking about speed, it will list those. Time in seconds and length are in feet. So we'll see here that we have feet per second mentioned. It's worth noting that it is mentioning miles per hour here and showing feet per second in brackets. That's fairly common, especially in this case where it's talking about uh, the following distance being calculated in seconds. So it says that this is roughly three seconds. Uh, listed here, but you'll notice that as I look down, um, we also have miles per hour, so that will be highlighted in the document as well. If I click that requirement, it will show me any time that I talk about miles per hour. But I also have kilometers per hour. So in this specification, if I can use this filter, uh, if you had a larger document with more requirements in it, I can use this filter to show everything that's consistent with the International System of Units. So we'll hear here, we'll see here kilometers per hour and seconds, and then everything that's inconsistent with the International System of Units. So this makes it very easy to identify that, hey, I'm actually using two different systems of measurement here. So that might be talking about the same thing, both talking about speed, or it could be in one place, you're measuring distance in inches, and in other places, you're uh, measuring speed in miles per hour. Uh, either way, being able to see them in this format can help you, especially when you have uh, multidisciplinary teams working together. This can help you to get everybody on the same page and quickly scan that document. So in a larger document, this is something that would take a person hours and hours, sometimes days to do manually to pull out all of these terms. 
And then there's always the possibility that there will be mistakes in that. By QVScribe pulling out these terms automatically, it saves you a lot of time and allows you to catch those uh, little issues that can cause big problems. So uh, I can see kilometers per hour. I can look at that in context and see that the system will work from zero to 137 kilometers per hour. So at this point, I should be asking the question, okay, is this actually saying how many kilometers per hour it should be, or is that a typo and it really should be 137 miles? So you can figure out, um, communicate with the necessary people to find out how that should be fixed and make the changes as necessary. So that's the consistency analysis. We'll jump back to QVScribe shortly, uh, but that's how we can help with uh, using appropriate units throughout the document. The next one is to keep it clear. So uh, no extra words. I'm gonna read a statement that probably looks very familiar to you. This is from a publicly available uh, pacemaker specification. And it says that the device shall be capable of storing patients indicators for pacing. So particularly with software requirements, this is very, very common to say that the system shall be capable of or shall be able to um, perform any given task. But I'm gonna change this into something a little bit different. I'm gonna use American football as an example. Uh, that phrase to be capable of, if we said that uh, we wanted to hire a new kicker for our football team and the new kicker shall be capable of kicking a field goal from a distance of 33 yards, well, I could probably kick a field goal from a distance of 33 yards, uh, maybe one out of 50 times. So if I meet that requirement by being capable of doing it, it doesn't mean that I'm actually fulfilling what the job of the kicker is to do. So I miss. Uh, so let's read that again. The device shall be capable of storing the patient's indications for pacing. So under what circumstances? Is that when it's plugged in? Is that when you're at the hospital and you're hooked up to the diagnostic equipment? Uh, when is it that it's capable of doing this? Uh, a lot of the time this isn't adding any value to your requirement. So you can actually just remove that phrase. A way that you could reword this is to say, the device shall store the patient's indications for pacing. It gets the same message across, but it's more concise and it's also easier to read and it doesn't add that level of, uh, of confusion or possible confusion as you're reading it. So that's just one way to keep it a little bit more concise and clear. Um, they call that superfluous infinitives. Uh, I prefer no extra words. It's just a little bit easier to say. <coughs> so uh, under concision as well, we have uh, separate, cla separate clauses. So what they mean by that is when you're writing your requirement, you should keep the, the verb uh, together. Uh, with the subject, so you're actually staying with, you're saying what the system shall do, and then if there's any conditions, those should either go before or after that core phrase. So when somebody's looking at the at your sentence, they don't have to be sitting there saying, okay, uh, system under these particular circumstances at this time and here is going to do this and try to piece that together. Uh, anytime that you're talking about what the system shall do, those should be together, and then any conditions that you have could either be listed uh, before or after that. That just makes it so much easier to read as you go along. So next we're gonna talk about, uh, the one that we're actually gonna focus here is the uh, defined conventions, but or no negative, sorry, but first we're gonna talk about punctuation. So uh, these simple things of using proper grammar and spelling and punctuation can make a huge difference when you're dealing with technical documents like this. So it's really important to get those small details right. A good example is this one, Jane enjoys cooking her family and her dog use a comma, save a life. So the use of commas can be very important because it can change the meaning of your sentence. This probably is supposed to be saying, uh, Jane enjoys cooking, her family, and her dog. Uh, you could have a debate about the Oxford comma in there too, but we wanna keep this on point. So no negatives. So in keeping as positive, um, defined conventions, sorry, I should mention as well, for the defined conventions, um, what they mean by that is when you're using uh, and, or, and not, uh, if you use those as capitals and uh, potentially put the phrases that you're putting together with brackets around them, that makes it easier to determine how you're structuring the sentence as well. It kind of goes along with punctuation. It's a little bit more of a formal way to write it, but the good news with writing it in that way is even if the person who's reading it is not uh, in a technical background and might not understand this, it actually still makes it easier for anybody to read. So you're saying uh, under any of these conditions, so if you say um, if it is uh, cloudy and rainy, for example, you could put that in brackets and, and by putting the and in capital letters, it just makes it clear that both of those things need to be present at that time. So next up for uh, negatives, a uh, good example I can give here, uh, we'll jump over here back to QBScribe. So I'm going to go to the quality analysis. So you'll see that QBScribe automatically gives a score from one to five for each requirement that's listed here. That's based on the actual quality of each individual requirement. So it's looking at a number of things 
If there's a problem with the imperative, it's automatically going to get a score of one to five. If you have some vague words, it'll probably get a three. If there's multiple instances, you might get a two like this one down here. But you can also sort this in a number of ways. So if I'm looking at this document and I want to deal with the ones that have the biggest problems first, I can go to score and sort them that way. I can also put them back to the way that they're ordered in the, in the document itself. Or I can sort them by issue. So these are actually according to the NCOSI guide. Any of them that are grayed out there, uh, we don't have that issue with this particular document. So I can see here, uh, no imperatives, negative imperatives, uh, vague words, passive voice detection, superfluous infinitives like we just talked about. So I'll jump into uh, the negative imperative. So there is one in this requirement spec that has that. It says that the vehicle will not exceed 85 miles per hour while using the full speed range adaptive cruise control feature. So you might think that this is the easiest way to write this, but in fact, anything that's written in the negative is impossible to verify in a, in a defined timeline. So what you're really asking here is the same thing that what you have above that was listed in kilometers per hour. You're saying this, the speeds at which the system should operate. So what you're saying here by saying it will not exceed, what you're really wanting the system to do is you want the system to limit the speed to 85 miles per hour. So just by wording it in that way, instead of saying it will not exceed, I'll actually go in and make that change. Again, this is in Microsoft Word, so I can make the changes on the fly. So uh, how might I say that? The vehicle, uh, shh, oh, but will. Limit the speed to 85 miles per hour while using that feature. Again, that just puts it into the positive, and this is something that's testable. Saying that it will put a limit on it is testable, saying that it will not do something ever is not testable. So I can actually put this in and reanalyze each requirement. And we'll see that this one now, uh, limit is identifying as a, a vague word. So uh, I should change that as well. And this is how it helps you along the way. So the vehicle, uh, we'll say, should actually be the system, so. And speeds of 85 miles per hour or lower while using. There we go. So we got a five out of five for that one so I can move on. So you'll see that the overall quality score is now three out of five. As I make changes to this as I go along, I'll be able to see how the quality of overall quality of the document is improving as I go. So we'll jump back to this in a couple minutes. That is the uh, how to use negatives properly. And also it mentions not using uh, slashes. So uh, by default, the slash isn't included in the configuration, but it's something that can be added uh, pretty easily. The issue that's with it right now is that it will also identify if you're using, say, uh, kilometers per hour, you're putting km slash h, it will identify it there as well. But it is helpful to identify when you're using slashes in a document to see um, that, they're being that they're not being used um, in the wrong places. So, the reason that slashes uh, are not a good idea is that they're uh, by design ambiguous. So it could actually mean either or, it could mean and. Uh, by using a slash, you're actually not specifying which one you mean by that. So it's just best to stay away from it altogether and specify exactly what you mean, just to ensure that it's not, uh, you're not leaving it up for interpretation. So next one we'll look at uh, involves singularity. So that's making sure that the, each requirement is uh, conveying a, a single thought. So that's the first one that's listed there. So saying that it needs to uh, communicate a single thought, this is something that you can help with uh, by using a template that we're going to talk about later, a system called EARS. Uh, but it's basically, basically making sure that your requirement statement uh, is not asking for multiple things and that it's communicated in a single sentence. So that's um, fairly hard to do when you're talking about complex things, but it's all about that granularity and just breaking it down level by level as you go to make it as concise and clear as possible for each requirement. So one that we're actually going to talk about here is combinators. So QBScribe will automatically check for these. For example, uh, repeated uses of the word and. So if I look at this requirement from a specification for a lunar rover, so the lunar exploration light rover, as they call it, it says here that it shall have lighting for conditions and robotic operations and potential proximity e, uh, extra vehicle your, uh, vehicular operations within 10 meters of the vehicle and for driving. So for example, it says uh, in front and behind the vehicle for 50 meters. So this requirement, uh, you'll see that it actually uses the word and three times. So that will be flagged in QBScribe as a um, unnecessary, uh, uh, and unnecessary use of combinators. So you'll see here that I can actually break this into two requirements and make it a lot more concise. 
it is okay to use and uh, in certain instances, uh, but it's when it's multiple times and you're actually conveying different ideas um, that it should be broken down. So you'll see here the Lunar Exploration Light Rover shall provide lighting 50 meters in front and behind the Lunar Exploration Light Rover. You could split that into multiple requirements as well. The one below, uh, the Lunar Exploration Light Rover shall provide lighting for 10 meters surrounding the Lunar Exploration Light Rover. We're going to talk about this one a little bit later as well, uh, as it also gives an example of um, uh, incorrectly uh, using the phrase, uh, the vehicle here. So that's inconsistent terms, which we're going to get to later on. So we've adjusted that to say Lunar Exploration Light Rover. Another side note while we're here, you can actually take that phrase Lunar Exploration Light Rover. If you include it in your glossary of terms and define what you mean by that, you can save some space on your page and make it easier to read by actually changing it to Lunar Exploration Light Rover, it becomes L-E-L-R. And if you're using that consistently throughout the document, it just makes it a bit more readable. So some other examples of the combinators are and, as well as, whereas, also words like that are implying that you have multiple ideas here uh, in the single requirement. So next one is that uh, should be implementation neutral. So that idea of the requirement saying what needs to happen and not why. The proper way to use this according to INCOSI is to actually include a rationale statement. So if you're using QBScribe, we can exclude comments or rationale statements from the overall analysis. So that's a helpful tool in that way. Uh, but overall, it's your job to make sure that your requirement is actually the, your core requirement statement, that single phrase is defining clearly what you're asking for for that particular requirement. So another way that uh, a problem that you can run into is by using parentheses. So if you put a parenthesis around something, you're basically saying this is uh, extra information or this is a further insight or another example. And in almost all cases, you can just remove the what's in the parentheses, maybe add it as a comment, but it doesn't belong in the actual requirement statement itself. And then enumerate sets. So what that means, if you have a set of requirements, rather than saying, um, they give the example in the event of a fire, um, you know, these different things shall happen. If there's only one condition, so again, the event of a fire, and then there's multiple things that need to happen, that should be broken into multiple requirements. So you can say, in the event of a fire, this will happen. In the event of a fire, this will happen. Make those separate statements, and then it's very clear as you're going through and easier to verify that each of those things do happen in that case. So another way that this can be used, um, move ahead here. Uh, enumerating sets and then uh, supporting references. So sometimes ideas are more complex. So if you need to communicate uh, the way that a system is relating to other systems, this is a, a situation where you can use your actual requirement to define what needs to happen and then say as per this supporting reference or this document or this other uh, requirement that gives further clarification on that. So that's what's meant by supporting references. And so in terms of completeness, there are uh, it's correct to not use pronouns. So I'll jump ahead here. So that could be words like it, this, he, she. It's automatically by using a pronoun, you're referring to another object or item without specifying who or what that is. So to keep it foolproof, uh, if you're not using the word, if you're using the word it, you're referring to something else that sometimes it's obvious, but it's actually much more readable if you just replace the word it with the actual name of what you're looking to fix. So in this case, we're talking about the all wheel drive capability if it is wheeled or all tracks driven capability, if it is tracked, um, it in this case is the Lunar Exploration Light Rover. But again, you can make that more clear. Drive line configuration, when equipped with wheels, the Lunar Exploration Light Rover shall have all wheel drive capability. And when equipped with tracks, the Lunar Exploration Light Rover shall have all tracks given capability. So this again is being rewritten without using those pronouns. Along these same lines with completeness, it's important to not include any heading references. So a uh, way that you could be using that is uh, in the event of an accident response, if you're saying that the, the system shall disengage at that point, you should actually write in the requirement itself, in the event of emergency, the system shall disengage, rather than just because it's under that heading of being emergency response, assuming that your requirement, uh, the person reading it is going to be able to make that connection, you should explicitly state the entire requirement in its own line, that if you were to remove it from the document and read it on its, on its own, it would still be clear what you're saying. So don't make references to the headings or the categories or what section your requirement is in. Make sure each requirement is concise and clear on its own. Next have to do with realism. So there's a few along these lines. One is uh, not uh, having things that are unachievable. So I'll go back to that requirement I was talking about in Q 
QV scribe. So if we go back to the analysis here, uh, the one that we were going to look at is this one that was given uh, down below here, that was given a score of two out of five. So you'll see that if any component of the system fails, so that could be the controller, radar, et cetera, so you'll see that et cetera is flagged, then the system will notify the driver and disengage immediately. So in this case, this is unachievable because nothing in the systems world or the real world happens immediately. So this needs to specify uh, how quick this response is needed. So since I'm not a subject matter expert in this area, I will say that needs to disengage within 0 0.2, uh, 0 0.2 seconds. And that will then uh, clear up that issue because I'm specifying how quickly this needs to happen. And that uh, absolute uh, term of saying that it needs to happen immediately uh, is rectified. So I can reanalyze that particular requirement will now uh, get a score of three out of five instead of two. There's a couple of issues that we'll need to come back to in a second, but that's dealing with that issue of uh, not being unachievable. Next is to define all conditions. So uh, repeat that condition with each, resp each response, similar to what we talked about earlier uh, with enumerating, so listing out each requirement. Uh, so if there's one condition um, and multiple responses, make sure each response gets its own, con its own requirement. And then for uh, specifying the list, so using the words all or any, uh, the difference between these two is that in their, under uh, the separate conditions here, there are actual different conditions that are all contributing to one response as opposed to one condition with multiple responses. So uh, when you're specifying these lists, it's important to make sure that you're clarifying whether this includes all. Uh, all of these conditions need to be present for this response to happen, or if any one of these things is present that that needs to happen. So just by listing them, you could leave that door open for, for which one. So uh, make sure to specify when you're using a list, specify whether all conditions need to be met or if any one of those conditions need to be met. And some other words for that immediately, uh, back to the unachievables, immediately, always, never, all. And again, these are all identified by QB scribe. And we'll keep it open. So again, talking about being implementation neutral, we talked about this a little bit earlier, so I won't spend too much time on it, but you should be specifying what needs to happen, not how it needs to happen. So in this particular requirement, uh, we'll read this one from the same document that we're looking at. The driver will be able to use buttons on the steering wheel to change the following distance whenever the system is engaged. So the problem here is uh, using buttons on the steering wheel. So uh, that's actually specifying how it needs to be done. Maybe it would be better if it was a switch or if it were sliders. So um, the, the proper way to write that would be when the uh, full speed uh, range adaptive cruise control system is engaged, the system will allow the driver to control the following distance. That leaves it up to the engineers and the designers to come up with the best way to actually implement that by specifying the buttons you're getting into implementation. So you wanna just say what needs to be able to happen and let the uh, designers do their part. So using universals properly, we're now gonna go back to that document again. So we received, we are now up to a score of three out of five for that particular document, their particular requirement that we were looking at. But we'll see that it's talking about if any component of the system fails, so talking about the controller, radar, et cetera, then the system will notify the driver and disengage within two seconds. So a way to fix that, we'll deal with these one at a time. So let's start with the controller. So we'll say, take out any, and we'll say if the controller fails, the controller of the system fails, then the system will notify the driver and disengage within two seconds. Then you can do the same for radar and any other uh, condition that needs to be met for this. Again, you are specifying what needs to happen. So it's your responsibility to make sure that you're listing each of those conditions so that when it gets to the testing phase, that's easily testable. So now I can reanalyze that requirement. And now it scores a five out of five. So we're able to move on. The other things that are covered under this uh, area of quantifiers are ranges of value. So a quick way to check for this is to say, and this is from the ENCOSI guide, if uh, say something needs to be at a particular temperature, you would say, okay, if it was you know, two degrees higher or two degrees lower or half a degree, either way, uh, would it still be okay? If yes, then you need to specify what that range is. So uh, the absolute values are difficult. So you can use those ranges of value to make it more clear what your targets are and include with that are using uh, measurable targets and definite time frames as well. Those are all kind of along the same lines. So again, back to this requirement, the driver has the ability to override or disable the system at all times. This is from that same document that we've been looking at. 
that issue of uh, being available at all times is an issue. So now uh, with our smartphones, we now know that cars can be connected at all times. You can change different settings. You can preset the cruise control. You can start the engine. Um, these controls are all available from the phone. So if you're reading a specification that says the driver needs to be able to disable the system at all times, that would mean potentially that he needs to be able to whip out his phone and turn on and off the cruise control system, which I don't think is uh, really necessary. So the way this should be written is a suggestion here would be when the full speed range active cruise control system is enabled, the system will enable, enable the driver to disable. So instead of saying this needs to be available at all times, it's specifying what times that's available. Again, that keeps your scope from going way beyond uh, what you actually mean it to cover and make sure, makes your uh, document more believable in that way as well, uh, more precise. Some other ones with quantifiers are, uh, are listed there as well. So we also wanna keep it standardized. There's a few ways we can do this with uniformity. Uh, the consistent use of terms. So uh, again, in QV Scribe, this is something that we can help with. So I will show you um, one of two more examples that we're going to use from here, and then we'll get into the questions. So under the consistency tab, we already looked at the consistent use of units. We can also do the consistent use of terms. So the way that I like to look through them is to sort them by frequency. So I'm looking here in this document, I talked about the system 16 times. So I can actually look at all of the instances that system appears in the document and see it in context. I also talk about the driver, the car, following distance, et cetera. So by bringing all of these terms together in list form, it makes it much, much easier to make sure that I'm using them consistently. So you'll see here, I'm talking about the system and the driver and the car. Um, I can look down this list and see, oh, well, I'm also talking about a vehicle. So the front vehicle, okay, that would be the vehicle in front of the car, but I wonder if I ever just talk about uh, the car as a vehicle. So if I type in vehicle here, you'll see that vehicle is used. So if I click on that term, it will show me in context following distance that the user allows the vehicle to slow down. Well, we know that the vehicle is the car in this case. So it's really important to use those terms consistently, just so you're not left asking when somebody's reading this, what exactly am I referring to? Similar to what we experienced uh, with the lunar exploration light rover being called a vehicle in that context as well. Just make sure that it's being used consistently and the uh, consistency analysis can help with that. Some other items to cover here are to define acronyms. So if you are using acronyms, for example, the Lunar Exploration Light Rover being the LELR, uh, as long as you define those in your uh, glossary at the beginning and the end, and you're using them consistently throughout, it is okay to use acronyms. What's not okay is to use abbreviations. So if you're using abbreviations, so uh, calling operations ops instead of operations, um, that just adds an unnecessary level of ambiguity and making sure that you're using uh, capital letters consistently throughout that as well to make sure that every time somebody reads something, they know that it's the same as those others, uh, other times that it's being used and uh, that's consistent across as well. Next is to use a project wide style, which ties in a little bit to our next one. So I'm going to skip ahead here. These are the last two. So under modularity, um, using a defined structure and grouping those relatives together uh, are, are somewhat connected, those can both be helped with using a defined structure such as the easy approach to requirement syntax or EARS. We have templates available that are written according to the EARS method. I'll give you a really quick overview. Uh, there's different sentence types that you can use. So anytime you're using a, a ubiquitous requirement that's just uh, for all time, then you would say uh, the system name shall and then give the system response. And then it gives different ways to format uh, your sentences according to whether it's event driven, state driven, for looking for unwanted behavior, and optional um, requirements as well. So under these per, uh, particular uh, situations. So uh, the EARS template and using that standard can help make sure that as somebody is reading the document, there's a familiarity to it that every requirement is written in the same way. Again, having your uh, system uh, as well as the verb together uh, makes it a lot easier to read in that way as well. So if we look at back at this, uh, appreciate you sticking with me. We've gone through all 40 of the rules in the INCOSI guide for writing requirements, focusing on a few of them. Uh, you can tell just from the amount of content that's come at you in this live tutorial, keeping all of those rules straight as you're writing requirements is very, very difficult. That's why QRA got involved in helping with requirements quality. Uh, the various tools that you use for managing your requirements are still very important, but we are focused on the actual content, making sure that uh, standards like this from the INCOSI guide are just that much easier to follow and you're not uh, spending all this time referencing back to these lists and spending too much time uh, in that analysis process. So back to Ultra Electronics, uh, they wanted to reduce the number of hours they were spending, standardize the requirements across their multidisciplinary teams, 
and mitigate potential risks. Uh, their results from using QV scry, which you can read about in our case study, um, was an increase in efficiency, unity, and quality, while actually reducing the amount of time it took to review and update their requirements by upwards of 75%. So this is fairly common for us, uh, people that are using QV scribe. Notice, especially with larger teams working together, uh, there's huge efficiency savings in getting everybody on that same page and learning to write requirements the same way. So a couple of quotes from that case study. Uh, risk reduction for one, detecting and correcting requirements in the definition phase before they can propagate to later phases of development where they become increasingly costly to fix is the greatest potential savings factor that QV scribe offers. And uh, again, this is a study from IBM. There's tons of resources out there that show this same trend. If you catch something in the requirements when it's just a matter of backspacing and correcting, uh, it's much easier to fix and much less costly than uh, at any other phase of either testing or of course, once the product is deployed. Another quote, they say, uh, we have references on writing on good requirements writing, but QV scribe is faster. And again, we found that very consistent across all of the documents that we've used uh, along the way. So if you'd like a copy of any of these slides, uh, the case study that we talked about here, or uh, even the video of this tutorial, uh, reach out to myself, or if you're working with uh, Kristen or Rebecca, you can reach out to them and ask for a copy of that. They'd be happy to get that to you. Uh, Trevor, if I could get you to post uh, in the chat window the link to the survey, that would be much appreciated. Um, there's a uh, getting us, helping us get to know your workflow uh, link that Trevor's going to send you. It's about nine questions that just go through what tools you're using now, what your responsibility with requirements is. Uh, it just helps to be a really good uh, introduction for us so that we can learn where you're coming from and then we can follow up with you uh, from there. So I see that we have had some questions coming in from the chat, so we'll take a few minutes to answer those. Uh, whenever you're ready, Trevor, if you have a first question for us, happy to address it. Yeah, actually one question that just came up in the Q&A box is, is the case study you mentioned in Help available to download? Answer that yeah, absolutely. So uh, send us an email. We'll be happy to send that over to you. It is available on our site as well, but we'd be happy to uh, send you the PDF uh, directly so you can download that. Any other questions? And uh, the next was, is this, is the information presented in this available in guide form, like a printable form? Uh, yes, actually just produced today. Uh, we have our uh, Incozy guide for writing, uh, automating the Incozy guide for writing requirements uh, article. And that's available for download as well. So if you reach out to us, uh, we'd be able to get you that early copy, although I believe it is it's going live today. So that will be available on our website, but we'd be happy to send that out to you as well uh, if you send us an email. And uh, the next question, after using QBScribe on a requirements document, is there a version increment feature that would ensure the latest documents supersedes earlier versions? Mm -hmm. So that question um, is a little bit more into uh, requirements management. Uh, I don't know if you could hear the, the question okay from Trevor, but it was saying uh, whether QVScribe will track those changes that are made as you go along. That is a little bit more into requirements management uh, capabilities, which the existing tools that some of you were using, uh, Integrity, Polarian, uh, even Atlassian will uh, help you uh, with that kind of change management. QVScribe at any stage of development, if you are using one of these other tools, uh, if you've made multiple changes, you can export as an Excel uh, document or Excel spreadsheet, uh, analyze the same way that we just did in Word there, and then put your requirements back in. So at key points of your development, you can run that analysis on it and then use your requirements management tool in that way. Okay, and uh, uh, the last question I actually have so far is, uh, does the tool work well with user stories? Uh, yes, so it can be used with user stories as well because ultimately, uh, although they're formatted in a different way, you might be using different uh, imperatives, but you want to have that same level of structure uh, when you're writing user stories for generally for agile, so for your software requirements. Um, those best practices of, of, you know, you're writing in a different format, but you still want to use consistent language. You still want to be able to verify um, the consistency across uh, your entire document. So. That's where the uh, analysis configurations come in. This is an individual version of QVScribe that I'm using here. So I can actually go in and change these configurations myself. So all the different uh, searches that are happening, I can go in and add or remove items from that list. So uh, with your user stories, you might not be using shall or must, but you'd have different words that you're using in that way. So you can add your own to that list there. And then each of these lists are, are customizable uh, for the user. If you're using QVScribe for Teams, which is our enterprise solution, uh, instead of having uh, every user with access to this, you'd have a list of set configurations that you can choose from from this dropdown. Uh, and then each user will be able to choose from the lists that have been 
uh, specified by the admins of the account. Uh, one that I didn't show was a similarity as well, so I will show that quickly. And if you have any other questions, you can type them in here now. Um, our similarity analysis is going to make sure that you don't have either contradictory or repeated requirements, particularly when you're bringing documents uh, together from multiple sources. Um, it's very easy to repeat things or to have contradictions in that way. So I'll sh quickly show you how this works as well. So I'm, I have this slider, if I put it up to 100%, I'll see that I have zero requirements that are exactly the same in the short specification. If I bring it down to say around 80%, you'll see that a number of them appear here. So each of these requirements have one that's similar. If I click on one, if the car in front of the subject car slows, it'll show me in context. And then it will actually show me which requirement is similar to that one as well. So it shows the matched requirement. And down at the bottom, I'm actually able to see them side by side. Um, the issues that are different are highlighted in red. Anything is that the same is highlighted in green. So we'll see here the number, of course, at the start is different. So these two requirements are 80% similar. One is talking about when the car is slowing down. The other is talking about when the car is speeding up. So I can check those, make sure that they're not in contradiction with each other, and then I can move on to the next one. So especially when you have a large document, you know, hundreds or thousands of requirements in one document, bringing those together and seeing that analysis gives you a lot of control as well. So uh, I don't know how I missed that, but I'm going back to it. Uh, are we ready for the next question, Trevor? Yeah, uh, Vlad asks, is it possible to get kidney scribe for self-use? Uh, for self-use, so um, just for uh, some like an independent consultant, that kind of thing. Uh, yes, so you can get an individual license. So rather than the QB Scribe for Teams uh, enterprise solution, there is an individual license available as well. So if you wanted to use this for uh, helping with your own clients, if you're in a consulting role, uh, helping your clients with their specifications, you can uh, run the analysis uh, on those documents and return that report to them. Uh, one way to use it if you do have uh, say you're working with outside teams on, a, on the document, you can take this that was written in plain natural language um, in paragraph form in Excel or in, in Excel or Word, and I can actually export this as a QB scribe report. I'll do one on the spot here right now. And in just a few seconds, this uh, really well put together clear uh, document comes up, uh, opens as a PDF. So this is available on anybody's computer. And as I scroll down here, you'll see that it gives me a breakdown of each score in the analysis. It also shows me how many times each issue comes up. And then it will show me uh, each requirement one by one with each of the issues that are identified in that quality score. You'll see it also shows the terms that are identified in this particular requirement. It'll also show me if there are similar requirements uh, to that one as well. If I scroll down a bit further here, you'll see that the full uh, similarity analysis is here as well. So it'll show me the requirements that are similar. Uh, there's not quite as much information as you have when you're actually using it in the tool, but this is very helpful to send out uh, or even before a review meeting so that everybody's on the same page with what's going to be covered when you go over that document. So that is a one way to use the tool if you're using it uh, independently. And I have uh, another question here. Can you say a few words about how to integrate the result of QDscribe into a requirements engineering tool already used by a company? such as IMS or JIRA, and how much effort that takes. Sure. So the problem, uh, I should say the, uh, the beauty of JIRA is that they give you a lot of control over how you get to manage your documents in that. So we found with other tools, uh, for example, if you're using um, Master Control or uh, IBM Rational Doors or uh, different tools like that, there's generally a CSV export import feature. It's a little bit different for each tool, um, but we've been able to work with uh, each of those tools successfully. So uh, we would basically, at those key points in development, export your requirements from the management tool, run the analysis as a spreadsheet in Excel, and then you can uh, import the changes back into your management tool. Now, the reason JIRA is a little bit different, uh, for example, one company that we were talking to had each requirement written as its own page in JIRA. Uh, that was really difficult to work with, so to, to pull them out and analyze them and put them back in, in that context didn't really work. Um, but the way that we use JIRA in our own development is we actually start our documents in Word and we can import those into Confluence and then eventually into JIRA. So at any point along the way in Confluence, you can actually export uh, fairly easily that uh, Word document and then run the analysis on it. So that's one way that it could be used uh, with Atlassian tools. Um, we'd have to learn a little bit about your situation to see the way that you chose to use uh, Confluence in that way because there are so many different applications, but that's one way that it can be used in that way. Perfect, and then uh, that is the last question. All right, so I uh, appreciate all of you taking the time. We are at the one hour mark here right now. 
So again, for next steps, uh, we'd be happy to perform a one-on-one -on -one live analysis with your own specification. If there's one that you're able to share with us, uh, if we have a, uh, if you need an NDA to be able to share that with us, we can certainly do that. Once QVScribe is installed on your own system, there's no communication back to us, so your information is secure. It stays on your own machines, um, but we would set up that NDA to, to do the first uh, analysis of your configuration if you'd like to do it, or your specification if you'd like to do that. Uh, we'd also be happy to provide a personalized solution for integration with your systems. Trevor has shared that link to the um, Q&A. If you'd like to fill that out, then we'll follow up with you personally to see how this could work for you. So follow the link in the follow-up email. You'll get one from either uh, myself, Rebecca, or Kristen. Follow the link in that email that you'll uh, receive either today or tomorrow, and uh, we'd be happy to follow up with you. You can send us a message uh, anytime from there. So 